persons and the speakers. So next, I would like to uh, welcome our chairpersons, P. L. Gautam sir, Ms. Dr. Gaurav Bhatia sir, Ms. Indra Jayakumar ma'am, and Radha Reddy Chetta sir. We move on to the we move on to the next uh, session. Uh, happy to introduce uh, Dr. Amit Mandal, and uh, he will be talking uh, now on. Albumin uh, leads in on ECMO patients. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Uh, uh, he's ensured that he's given us the topics that uh, you know, have very little literature on and probably not our strengths. So, uh, try and do justice. This is how I would probably go through uh, you know, the where probably we could probably use the albumin. The data is largely extrapolated from the role of albumin in resuscitation and septic shock, and that's how I would probably go through. Needless to say, that human albumin is the most abundant protein in plasma. It is a highly soluble molecule and it contributes about 80% of the total plasma of body pressure. And one gram of albumin almost attracts 18 mils of water by its oncotic uh, activity, and an infusion of 25 grams uh, uh, increases or expands the plasma volume by about 450 mils. It is synthesized in the liver, and there are various preparations that are available. Five percent is uh, what is isosmotic plasma, typically used in therapeutic plasma process. Twenty and twenty-five percent is hyper oncotic and is roughly equal to uh, plasma volume of over four to five times higher than the increased volume. And this is where you would use it in where you want to have some oncotic effect. These are the various formulations that are available. They differ in the Osmolarity and the osmolarity, there is the difference in the electrolytes also. Mind you, albumin is typically contraindicated in acute tra traumatic uh, brain injury. And yes, it could be uh, used for volume expansion, especially when we are using large volume of crystalloids. Uh, the, the higher concentrations do have lower uh, electrolyte content, and that's what needs to be kept in mind. A lot of us are, are using more albumin today in probably primary because of the fact that our uh, our learning processes, our thought processes have changed in terms of fluid transport when it comes to uh, the Stalin principle. You know, from the earlier hydrostatic compound pressure differences, now we have gone on to the revised Stalin principle, where uh, you know we do talk about uh, the uh, endothelial glycocalyx probably playing as a selective barrier to the plasma macromolecules, and it is the sub glycocalyx which probably works as the uh, generates the significant colloid compound pressure, uh, which typically determines the transcapillary flow and that's why it's, it's kind of lost. The use of albumin typically uh, you know, kind of reduces the vascular permeability and the addition of leukocytes and platelets and this is where probably the mechanistic action of albumin <coughs> is still much too uh, probably be disappeared but yes there is a colloid osmotic pressure paradox and that's how probably its utilization happens. The way that we use albumin in, in today's world is primarily for intravascular volume expansion and this was a safe study which was done in 2004 which suggests that compared to saline it had a larger volume of, uh, expansion compared to saline. The various studies that have been done in, in terms of in the septic population suggest that there could be a, a, a possibility of a and these are mind you most of them are the subgroup analysis which does talk about that there probably could be a survival benefit. So, where do we use it in, in, in terms of the ECMO? In terms of uh, use, uh, if you have managed patients, I have had the fortune of having just a few patients. And my experience would be minuscule compared to what the others have been here. Uh, typically, these patients are significantly limited and unstable, primarily because of the disease, primary disease process itself. And when in, in these patients, when they uh, develop shock and they need to be resuscitated, and typically the extracorporeal circuit may itself may trigger significant amount of capillary leakage and intravascular volume depletion, and that's why probably we will need some amount of fluids. There are certain goals which we use with uh, manage, uh, try to manage with anotropic and basal process support, trying to meet, meet a map of uh, 65 uh, or a cardiac index of more than 2. And this is where we would probably use uh, intravenous crystalloids or balanced crystalloids or colloids or blood transfusion. And mind you, this is where we need to be patient specific and there is no specific guidelines as to how you do it, probably go by the website and at the individual patient. In terms of, you all understand that in the resuscitation, if you probably hypophil your patient or hyperphil your patient, there are risks both sides of organ dysfunction as well as of 
uh, of fluid overload symptoms. Crystallites, typically the uh, continue to be the first line of therapy, balanced crystallites do have some benefits. Albumin needs to be administered uh, and probably beneficial in, in the septic population, particularly in patients with cirrhosis. And synthetic colloids are a complete no-no and that has been a practice change over the, in the last two decades. And there is a, a concept of the restrictive fluid administration with the recent trial on renewal which was published in 2017 also started questioning the uh, restrictive fluid uh, administrative therapies also. So this is where probably we will have to have a, a fine balance between hypovolemia and hypovolemia and that is where probably some role for albumin does come in. To compare the trials, uh, comparing fluid versus no fluid or different amounts of fluid, uh, we are our processes compared to reverse when we first, uh, you know, uh, on the basis of the survival sepsis guidelines, when we kept pumping fluids. The fact and the fee stu studies came across as a, as a, as a, as a, as a completely therapy changing procedure where uh, studies which we talked about more of conservative fluid management therapies and need to avoid significant bolus uh, uh, of the fluids in the critically ill, particularly in the children. The, this was the, from this fee study in the afternoon some cardiac. More fluid or more vasopressors also are not uh, beneficial and this was the study from uh, I published in 2017. The uh, study in 2017 from I think Australia which was uh, done in the major abdominal surgery also questioned that probably restrictive fluid approach could be harmful uh, particularly with renal injuries uh, in, in these patients and that's where uh, we probably again have to come down to a, uh, at the bedside to find and find tune our patient to individual patients. Over the years, this was a beautiful paper published and compared the practice in 2007 and 2014, looked at the significant change uh, in, in how we use fluids today. So if you look across, probably significant amount of uh, uh, albumin is being used compared to what it was in 2007. Yes, the, the meta-analysis uh, uh, when it comes to uh, mortality benefit does suggest uh, that albumin could be better in, in, in based on the safe algorithms and the year study. The only study that I could find was basically a retrospective study paper from uh, Germany and this was again a letter to the editor where they took, looked up into albumin uh, fluid resuscitation in patients with VA ECMO uh, and they uh, suggested that they had uh, seen significant improved survival. So this was a retrospective study uh, um, and it had about 280 odd patients or 112 patients received albumin plus crystalloid and they received about 60 to uh, 60 grams in about 24 hours and around 170 patients received only uh, crystallites. This was again as I said, uh, 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 you know the regimen was basically balanced crystallite versus uh, balanced crystallite plus albumin together and they did suggest that there was, I'm sorry about this graph not coming up appropriately, that there was a hospital uh, mortality benefit, uh, hospital survival was significantly higher in the albumin group. And a cumulative incidence of hospital mortality in the mass board was in favor of the use of albumin. And albumin fluid resuscitation independently did improve in their uh, retrospective study to the tune of an odds ratio of 0.3. In the maintenance, uh, there is an opportunity for use of uh, albumin in the ear and how, because we understand that ECMO is a device which uses a centrifugal pump which generates some amount of negative pressure on the patient's venous circulation and the ECMO circuit then drives the blood flow. In terms of the patients are hypovolemic or there's a high pump speed, the negative pressure that is generated by the pump could cause some amount of venous collapse and this caused that chattering or the chugging feel or the rhythmic pulsation. Uncontrolled, uh, this may progress to significant fluctuations and the consequences are progressive hypoxemia. Mind you, uh, a lot of these patients could be severely hypoxemic and that would be probably for one of the reasons for being on a, on a, on a ECMO support. Excessive negative pressure in the renal canal may also trigger significant amount of hemolysis uh, and by injuring the red cells. Hypovolemia in these situations we normally try and manage with uh, fluids, and this is where probably rather than repeated boluses of renal fluid, that could be some role for albumin. We also need to be mindful that chattering or uh, chugging, as it is called, need not be only just post pump tube uh, chugging, but could be uh, pump also. And, and the post pump tube chugging, uh, this is where it is not hypovolemia, but the, uh, the, the blood flow velocity which need to be modified. So, in terms of uh, in, in uh, severe volume depletion or shock, intravenous 
huge are required and this is where probably there is a case scenario where we could probably use flocculation like albumin uh, and so that is the uh, extrapolation from the data that we have so far. In terms of weaning, yes, uh, you know, uh, after, uh, you know, this is the standard of practice, salvage, optimization, stabilization and de-escalation. Only if the patient is probably in a negative balance and that's what the negative fluid balance that in the, in the various studies have suggested that there is an improved survival uh, benefit to the, uh, and in these situations, there after the initial resuscitation period of is over, there could be an opportunity where we could probably remove some uh, amount of fluid and ease the patient on the weaning process. There is uh, 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 literature support suggesting that albumin could improve uh, uh, the effect of diuretics, minor but temporarily, and particularly in backgrounds of hypovolemia. But along with Curizumab, they have shown that the, uh, the negative fluid balance was better without any uh, significant hemodynamic instability. Combination therapy may also help and was, it was more pronounced in particular in patients who were hypovolemia. To conclude, uh, hemodynamic instability continues to be the norm and would be so felt in the, in the patient connection. Shock resuscitation and the extracorporeal circuit may uh, trigger a capillary leakage and intravascular volume depletion, which would necessitate significant uh, fluid therapies. The optimal fluid therapy uh, in VA or VA ECMO uh, still remains unclear, but yes, there lies the, that way we could probably use some amount of colloids. And these whether it's the balanced crystalloids or colloids or uh, uh, blood transfusions will have to be probably be patient specific at the bedside. So with that, I close. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, wonderful lecture. Always uh, good. Giving very comprehensive questions and treatment from the house. Yes, Dr. Bush, please. What are the just uh, uh, one comment on the albumin. We are so far using albumin only for uh, our, uh, its role as a sort of osmotic. But we need to consider the role of albumin in, uh, beyond osmotic. Uh, it, it, it has got a plethora of role in maintaining redox potential, in maintaining the uh, metabolic uh, view of alcohol. The carrier, carrier molecules. In fact, there are some studies coming up that albumin can actually be, be uh, in that uh, glycocalyx and restored by the albumin. In fact, the LDO style, the septic shock subgroup, which has shown the benefit of albumin, is probably not related to its osmotic production, more related to its non osmotic production. So, albumin uh, is probably a molecule which is a key further. So, like in the ECMO patients also, some of the patients are uh, leaking out also and uh, you need a fluid and blood loss is also there. Now the training steroid is going to restrict the policy in uh, ECMO patients also as a substitute for that. I mean, what is your cutoff value on you patient animators also sometimes uh, in practice, uh, you know, advice, like one more ECMO for the albumin. Cutoff value for albumin? Yeah. So when you start I'm thinking that they should be now uh, immune infused also because it adds to or mostly patients are sick but sometimes people think that 2.52 or 1.5 that may start supplementing uh, currently albumin also. So just to correct the hypoalbuminia probably would not uh, suggest the use of albumin but yes if the patient is immunodynamic unstable and I am uh, required to put in some uh, uh, some amount of fluid therapies, there I would probably use the albumin, particularly if the patient already has a hypoalbuminic state. Yes, if there is uh, um, associated anemia also, then there are uh, targets defined where to use the PRBCs appropriately. So I would probably not use albumin right up front, uh, but I would probably use it judiciously as in when put back. That's the diplomatic answer that I might say. <laughs> If your patient is water laden and is hypoalbumin laden, first thing to do is to diuresis. Okay. But if that is already happened or that is not sufficient water, then you can add, add albumin. If the patient is on a high allotropic support in the VA ECMO and albumin is low, and your cutoff, normally I take two as a cutoff. 
approach to I would put it to work. But if the algorithm instead of algorithm level is less than two, vision is higher than two, then I may give algorithm to reduce the time. Thank you. Sir. Sir. No. Sorry. 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 There's the 5% as well as the 20%. So the 20% is hyperround cortex. If you want to pull out fluid, then we give the uh, 20% when there is hypoalbuminemia. So as you mentioned, albumin and LASIK, we call it in ARD as the PAL therapy, keep albumin and LASIK. But that's the 20% hyperound cortex to pull out fluid, not in patients with shock. On the other hand, you have the 5% albumin or the 20% reconstituted as the 5% albumin. That should be used when the patient is leaky and in shock, not the 20 percent, because the 20 percent leaks more and it will actually pull out fluid into the interstitial. So this is the difference between the albumin. But beautifully brought out that the, the albumin has a role in the glycocalyx, uh, you know, sealing, and it actually may reduce your capillary leak. So that's the five percent that we are talking about in acute capillary leak and shock. Thank you. Thank you. Comment on this part. There is, there is a slight study published from Australia and the UK where uh, 20 and 25 percent albumin is used for uh, resuscitation purpose. And I do use in my practice for the last five years, the, I do use uh, 100 ml of 20 percent albumin as bolus for resuscitation when my patient's uh, balanced crystalloid bowl is going, say, exceeding 2 liters, 2 and a half liters, and when I'm expecting the patient will be fed. And this white study has shown some advantage of giving 20 or 25 percent albumin over hypo oncotic fluids like 5 percent or 4.5 percent. So it's not that 20 or 25 percent albumin cannot be used in case. There is a data, it, this study was based on a data from UK where actually if you give hyper oncotic albumin compared to the hypo oncotic albumin, they remain in the blood circulation for a longer period of time. And why the demand in the circulation for a longer period of time, that probably requires more study. But that, that there is definite data that giving 20 or 25 percent of is as resuscitation fluid is better than 4 and 4.5 percent of it. And it is cost effective also. Your 20 percent of movement is already in So it's much better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosch. I think. Uh, uh, so we move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next topic, uh, how can I maintain nutrition in my ECMO patients, especially during the long ECMO? Uh, Dr. Gesh Pandey, a good friend of mine, get a lot of uh, area one test is uh, mechanical ventilation, traction, traction control. So, Dr. Pandey, senior director and uh, head DLK Hospitals for the Super Specialty of Fred Delhi. He is past general secretary, ICCM, and he organized clinical care. Uh, just uh, 2023, so past Vice Chancellor Indian College of Clinical Care Medicine, he has a lot of uh, achievements and awards uh, to his credit. So, Dr. Pani, please. Thank you, Dr. Gautam, and thank you, Vivek and the DMC, for inviting me to this uh, uh, symposium. And it's always a pleasure to visit DMC. Uh, the question is, uh, you know. We often talk about nutrition, but it's a difficult area. Difficult area because we are not interested, really not interested in nutrition. Uh, if we have time, we have sorted out all other issues, then possibly we uh, look at nutrition. Primarily as nutrition, you know, uh, in the beginning, very few of us do. I don't do it, uh, let me frankly admit. And the data shows that 30 to 50% of patients in ICU are malnourished. And data also shows that the calorie deficit, that is what you are prescribing and what your patient is getting, is about 50% in these patients. And data also suggests that you, if you have supervised nutrition programs in ICU, then your calorie intake becomes better and uh, nutrition uh, status becomes better. And possibly this will reduce, uh, lead to reduction in mortality. No different because we are too much concerned about the lines, pipes, pump coagulation, infection, other things, and uh, nutrition is at the bottom of it. Un unless the patient has stayed for a prolonged time, he's stable, and then we say, yes, uh, we'll let us look at the protein and the calorie. So these patients are susceptible to protein energy malnutrition. It's a hypercatabolic state with protein catabolism, hypermetabolic state, 
and there is insulin resistance as well. Endogenous nutrition stores are depleted in these patients and uh, uh, this is the data from the uh, ECMO patients. Only 68% of target nutrition goals were achieved in one study and only 55% in the other study. So you can understand how much is the uh, energy deficit that these patients would be accumulating over a period of time. Now these patients, it's very important to realize that they need, they do need the nutrition. There is a high risk of infection and complication as has been highlighted. And these patients oftentimes are on uh, uh, vasoactive agents, steroids, long term sedation, which may impair the GI function and the uh, you know, enteral nutrition per se. Uh, ECMO will also result in prolonged ICU stay, which itself is an uh, independent factor for inadequate nutrition and will lead to uh, iatrogenic malnutrition. Now this cartoon depicts the challenges of nutrition in the ECMO patients. So you can see that largely the metabolic changes result in energy and nutrient deficiency, then there is GI dysfunction. EN intolerance is uh, something we need to consider and it's an independent risk factor the ECMO therapy for inadequate medical nutrition therapy. So it's difficult and uh, uh, it may have uh, you know a poor uh, result in a poor patient outcome. So uh, and specific guidelines regarding what we should feed what we should do in ECMO patients are not there not the, the subject has not been debated so much. So this is one paper where they looked at the, uh, the nutrition status, a retrospective study, and they found that, uh, you know, uh, intolerance did not differ between VV and VA uh, in terms of the enteral nutrition, uh, but they uh, did give uh, PN, some patients require supplemental PM, uh, PN also, as Dr. Mehta highlighted, and almost 80% of nutrition goals were achieved in first two weeks. Now, one of the most difficult things is how do you assess the nutrition status because uh, early and late phase demarcation becomes vague in the uh, ECMO patients. Uh, uh, early would be less than 48 hours. So normally all patients would be, you know, uh, on ECMO for more than 48 hours, they will potentially be at nutrition risk. So we have to think of nutrition therapy early. If you look at the traditional way of uh, looking at the assessment, nutrition assessment, Indirect calorimetry has a lot of limitation. We don't even practice in our regular, you know, intensive care units. But with ECMO, there are special challenges. And uh, uh, the uh, 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 energy expenditure protocol for ECMO has also been given as a, as a tool uh, for indirect calorimetry. But again, that also is not a perfect tool. These indirect calorimetry have to be validated in the ECMO patients. That is the status as of now. Nutrix score, NRS 2000, subjective global assessment, and then the age old Harris Benedict equation. These are some of the tools available. Nutrix score, if you see, it's been said that it is not very relevant in the uh, patients undergoing ECMO, but you can, uh, it's, a, it's a fair score. And uh, the problem would be if you include IL 6, the levels may be very high because of ongoing ECMO, and plus if there is some. Uh, super added infection. Uh, NRS 2000 again it looks at uh, uh, severity of the illness of the patient. If the patient is severely ill then you proceed for a proper evaluation. So ECMO patients would fall under the severely malnourished category. If the age is more than 70 we add one so they become very very sick. So the idea is these patients we have to consider as severely malnourished if they are on ECMO for some time. Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition has suggested that you know they are concerned about the extent of uh, non-volitional weight loss in patients undergoing ECMO, low body mass index, reduced muscle mass, reduced pore intake, malabsorption, issues like GI intolerance, and they have uh, uh, classified based on disease burden, inflammation, uh, severe malnutrition into grade one, stage one, which is moderate, and stage two, which is severe. There is also a belief that ECMO is bad for the gut, especially the VA ECMO, uh, because there are hemodynamic uh, alterations, there is decrease in uh, pulsatile flow to microcirculation, so gut uh, perfusion is affected, particularly in VA ECMO. So, enteral feeding 
it's perceived may not be safe or may not be tolerated. And even in BV ECMO, that dysfunction may be exacerbated because of the inflammation and that could result in gut barrier dysfunction and bacterial translocation. So there are genuine concerns about it. But EN, as was being discussed, offers certain advantages if we start it early. Splachnic uh, perfusion is better. It stimulates the interstitial mortality, preserves the gut epithelial barrier function. Uh, willis height maintains willis height for absorption of nutrients, maintains gut immunity, maintains the gut microbiota, and reduces insulin resistance. And there is lower incidence of stress ulcer formation. But what has been seen is for anything and everything that we do in our patients in ICU, the first thing is let us stop uh, uh, nutrition. Let's stop, keep him NPO for whatever reason, and then we forget to restart. So frequent interruptions lead to macro micronutrient deficiency. A uh, lot of literature in ECMO patients has shown that uh, EN is safe in these patients. Bowel ischemia in one series uh, of uh, ECMO patients was only found to be 0.7% when the patients were fed enterally. Early trophic, if we are concerned, we can start with early trophic feed, something like 500 kcal, and then we can ramp it up slowly over a week's time. If there is no hemodynamic instability or feeding intolerance, we should give early enteral nutrition to all patients undergoing ECMO. There are ways by which we can reduce gastric intolerance. We can have the head up if it is feasible, and we can uh, uh, gradually increase the target, calorie target and the volume. Uh, we can monitor for GI intolerance and we can uh, also uh, use uh, drugs like metoclopramide. But there is a word of caution here. When we are using prokinetics, if they increase the QT interval, then we, we should uh, look at this, we should monitor it. So all these have been identified. Now looking at the protein goals. Non-obese patient, this is now for all general critical care. There are no separate uh, you know, uh, figures available for ECMO patients. 1 to 1.3 gram per kg per day, but oftentimes <coughs> patients on ECMO would also be on RRT. Now there, there is significant amino acid loss, uh, about 2 gram per hour uh, for patients undergoing hemodialysis, 0.2 gram per liter filtrate per dialysate for continuing VV hemofiltration and 0.6 for continuous VV hemodialysis. So it's been suggested that a simple marker would be looking at urea creatinine ratio. We know normal is, you know, uh, urea is 40 to 100, so if that's to 1. And if it is more than 100 is to 1, then we say that it is pre-renal, uh, you know, start of pre-renal failure. There is conflicting data about immunonutrition and micronutrients. Some studies have shown that there are significant loss of alanine, arginine, cysteine, glutamine, uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Other studies have not reported any such, you know, major losses. Uh, but it's generally believed that EN should provide 50 to 150 microgram of selenium per day per 1500 kcal and PN should provide 60 to 100 microgram selenium per day. So it will be a good idea to look at the plasma uh, selenium levels. If it is less than 0.4 micromole per liter, then we can uh, supplement uh, with the selenium. Same applies for uh, vitamin A, E, also for D, because these levels are also found to be low, so we can find out the levels and then make corrections. Now, PM, there are issues here because of the ECMO circuit. PM is a, uh, is a the fluid is viscous fluid, so lipid emulsion especially can damage the ECMO circuit, the stop box may break, agglutination may occur, and clogging of the membrane oxygenator can occur, and it could also lead to clot formation in the circuit. So wherever possible, use if you are if you have to supplement TPN for some reason because there is EN intolerance, uh, then a separate dedicated. It's always good to have a separate dedicated line rather than infusing through the ECMO circuit. So there are issues with both. Uh, uh, if you look at the PN, the atrogenic overfeeding may occur, volume overload may occur, liver dysfunction, hyperglycemia. All this we already know because these are no different than patients who are not on ECMO. So the suggestions are keep the PN volume low, avoid overfeeding, maintain glucose 150 to 200 milligram per day and avoid hyperglycemia. 
if you are giving propofol which is rich in uh, omega-6 fatty acids then you should be concerned about the total fat uh, load and you should be watchful if serum triglyceride is uh, you know more than 400 milligram per dl you can switch to non-propofol based sedation so and uh, the uh, supplemental pn again it's a choice uh, which will vary from patient to patient so this is what we have as barriers of uh, EN and barriers of PN. Uh, the, there are certain perceptions, so these are the fear, uh, consequences that we have for uh, EN. They are GI ischemia, bacterial translocations, planktic steel, risk of bleeding, GI dysmotility, and for PN, mechanical complication, infection, infection, liver damage, replacement of circuit, malperfusion. So, the one paper that addresses this, uh, you know, issue in ECMO patients is uh, a recent paper published in the Journal of uh, Parental Enteral Nutrition. It suggests that we should be looking at the malnutrition or nutrition risk, and we should look at the uh, the goals. Uh, we can use a body weight based formula, simple, 25 kcal per kg uh, body weight per day. But rather than not doing anything, we should actively be looking at the nutrition. And we should look at ways to improve the adequacy of nutrition, that there is no deliver deficit. Uh, we should look at bowel motility, gastric residual volume, etc. Optimize analgesia, fluid status. And uh, uh, we should also look at the proteins. And especially if patient is undergoing simultaneous renal replacement therapy, we should be concerned. And uh, we can use your creatinine, uh, uh, urea creatinine ratio as a biomarker to monitor the catabolism. And type and composition again, like I said, it's better to measure and then supplement, but we should be cautious about deficiency of these when patient is on, uh, you know, uh, ECMO. So the uh, conclusion is feed your ECMO patient, think about nutrition, determine the nutrition requirements, monitor, optimize and re-evaluate and choose the route of nutrition. Do not blindly believe that EN doesn't, my patient will not tolerate EN. Oftentimes the patients will tolerate EN, you can build up slowly. So avoid prolonged and nutrition deficit in these patients as it is a hypercatabolic state. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. It was a very, very comprehensive uh, and clear review of the latest guidelines. Uh, before we open uh, the session, I will have the first question, sir. Sure. Uh, with a couple of uh, queries. One, do we still use gastric residual volumes to ramp up the feed because there are conflicting goals of providing adequate nutrition and yet there is a high risk of gut failure there? It will continue to be a debatable issue. If you remember long back when we were students, we were told that it has to be, the gastric residual volume has to be, uh, you know, uh, very low and you will consider that as a significant barrier. Now we know it has to be very large, almost to the tune of 500 and otherwise you are not concerned. So, but the issues become more relevant when the patient is on ECMO. So I would say these will be clinical decisions based on not only gastric residual volume, but maybe uh, looking at the bowel sounds, looking at uh, other factors. So that will continue to be a difficult decision, but it is important to monitor because this is an indicator that the, maybe the gut is not working or the, you know, there are issues with bowel. Yes, please. Uh, a very nice lecture, sir. Nice listening to you talking about nutrition. Uh, there are guidelines for ECMO. Yes, gastric residual volume in general is not uh, uh, looked into for our ICU population. But in patients with ECMO, gastric residual volume has to be monitored. But the threshold where you need to be cautious is 150 to 300. That has been specified where you do take it as 150 ml and then be cautious about gastric residual volume. So, but in general it is 500 ml, but for them it is reduced because of their requirement to be cautious. One comment, yes. one must realize that these patients are catabolic for a long period of time. Yes. That is, in, at least in neonates, uh, they can up to three weeks, they can be severely catabolic. The protein requirement can go up to three grams per kilo Absolutely. in neonates. And the energy requirement can be up to 100 kilocalories per, 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 per kilo body weight. 
Also, one has to realize that they may be malnourished, most of them are malnourished before they put on any session of it. Yes. So, we have to take the deficit into mind also. So, they are catabolic for a long time. And they so, that's why the general assumption should be that they are severely malnourished. Or we treat them as malnourished, basically, yes. even if they don't meet the classic uh, criteria. And also, the, see, if you look at the Indian nutrition guidelines, I was the author, GRV is really not that strongly recommended because it is the nurse says sees 300 minutes and they will stop feeding the patients. As the papers already showed, that 50 percent of the times the patients are not fed while they are fed. So you can make things worse by taking too much of giving too much of it. Give pro if necessary. Yes. If the patient is in higher health groups, obviously you will uh, refrain from uh, actual nutrition. Even if the GR volume is higher. We have the other alternatives to transpalloric or things are adding the pro yeah, yeah. But the feed, because if the patient can take a 2 liter plus uh, secretion from the oral cavity and that, that should be considered. Right? And bowel sounds uh, these days, uh, it's not taken very yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah, Rather, yeah. no one is monitoring these days, uh, not giving much of uh, uh, benefit. So, what is very important to point is be to go for, you know, uh, either duodenal or jejunal feed and flan it before you are initiating yes. more because otherwise, then. Insertion would be a, be a it will be difficult, but now there are a couple of things which are easy to place uh, transpaloric also. You have uh, electronic guided, and uh, you can't take the image and can see on the arm or thing. But on bedside, we can do with the even ultrasound. There are uh, electrical devices which you can just be placed there, like a pacemaker there. You can just place it there and see the guide uh, going uh, because they are take these electronically active. So those things are there, we can uh, do that. I'm not familiar, so I will No, so it's available. Uh, um, I've seen it, uh, the demo also. It's not very costly. The thing is, how it's done is, you place a pad over the stomach, abdomen, and start putting the, uh, this line. There is a guide where the tip is, uh, uh, is tricked up by the, that meter, like electrical impedance. It picks up the signal sphere. So where the, your guide is going, uh, the catcher, you can just see on the monitor. It's as good as uh, uh, the way we put the other uh, image in Yes. It's yeah. not, uh, it's bad side. Regarding this uh, gastric GRB, I think that is still a role important role. I am aware of this guidelines, East Bay, Nashville, well, etc., which talks about tolerating GRB up to 500 ml. But believe me, in clinical practice, if you are telling your nursing staff and your junior doctors that so, you know, go on feeding this patient literally, an adult uh, patient I am talking about. Uh, if your DRV is uh, you know, not even uh, up to 500 ml, invariably these patients end up in vomiting because there will be mouthful of uh, regurgitant fluids and it all leads to microaspiration and hospital network pneumonia and back incidences will rise. Because even if your patient is a ventilator with cough fever, etc., microaspiration do happen, we know that, even if you are not uh, with, uh, without regurgitation. So, with regurgitation, it definitely need to have incidences of that. So, in our practice, we follow up to our treating protocol. If it is less than 50% of the previous feed, suppose I am giving 200 ml of second hourly, if it is less than 50 ml of 50% uh, of the previous feed, and the next feed. But if it is more than 50% of the previous feed, of course you have to consider what is the things have been modifiable and that is an unmodifiable factor that we have to look into. Number two is about patients being on high doses of acidosis, etc. We have something called the uh, Digested polypeptides, even digested polypeptide options are better. Most of the companies actually do that. And in our practice, we do that. And we have around a case of case series of 118 patients where we have used this and results are better in patients who are not tolerating things. And in terms of the uh, kind of tubes I was talking about, placing trans pyloric uh, uh, feeding tubes, I think we also have uh, nasogastric tubes. They have their stillets inside, like they have wires. And they are stiffer than the routine ones, which are the more compliant ones. That can also be going beyond the... That's what we use, Freca tube. Freca yeah, tube is exactly what this is using, but the only problem is Freca tube, sometimes you don't know. Although with the ultrasound, even we, I, we are practicing this thing, uh, we try to see through the... Uh, because polaris is not difficult to see in not surgical patients, you can see easily. But uh, the, this electrical device which has come, is quite uh, easy to do with that, because you can see the tip going everywhere where it's going in the abdomen. Otherwise, sometimes uh, putting uh, Freca tubes blindly is difficult sometimes. Just to add in your 
points, madam. Uh, the guidelines don't say that you do not see uh, or check the GRVs. They do say you check GRVs in those patients where you monitor at risk. You know that there is some abdominal distension, there is some risk, then you monitor. But in general scenario, do not do GRV where it is not actually required because that is about wasting your feed and refeeding. Probably not all institutions will refeed, so to not really get into that practice of guidelines, so they've said that we do it with caution. See, one of the issues in these patients is they are heavily sedated, oftentimes heavily sedated. So they can't tell about the abdominal pain, so we might miss the uh, gut ischemia. The fear is about the ischemic bowel. So, uh, but I think a careful clinical examination looking at everything, because there is no one solution for everything. So largely, a lot of things where we do not have clear-cut answers, it is the clinical acumen, your daily rounds that you, you decide what is best for your patient. That's very true, Dr. Pani. Because guidelines are very strong as far as hematocrit instability is concerned, where you have to hold on. Because the, the nature, the biological mechanism is uh, pushing the blood to the vital organs. And splenic ischemia is one of the areas where it has to be. If you try to feed those patients at that time, it's going to lead to this. It's not recommended. The guidelines are quite strong in that way. And they also. Yes. That's an indication that some hypoperfusion is there. Uh, that's most times the sufferer is the gut Good morning, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Very well explained. Um, actually, we deal with the ECMO patient, and uh, I have seen, like, uh, as you have already explained, that ECMO is bad for gut. And uh, we have seen that patient is having a severe loose juice. And at that time, we go with the peptide-based formula, but still we were not able to uh, meet the nutritional requirement in that particular uh, situation when the patient is suffering from this weird entry. So, what time pay? What we have to do it, sir? So? Difficult question. See, you have seen that in some of the good centers, they achieved only 79% of the calorie that was required for the ECMO patient in that series. And by and large, it is 50 to 60 percent, not more than that. So I think uh, any diarrhea has to be looked into it, and you have to because these patients would also be on multiple antimicrobial therapies. Uh, so you need to look at the uh, uh, look at the C. diff infection also. Keep that possibility. You can do a stool analysis for that. And you know all the formula feeds. Uh, some patients will tolerate them very well. Other patients may not tolerate them. So diarrhea is oftentimes a complaint when you are using purely these Dibba feeds. So you have to see and maybe change which formula is better for your patients. So I leave, leave it at that. I have no clear that answer for your question. <laughs> I think <laughs> questions can be answered in the next uh, panel discussion is there. All right. Thank you. So we are closing session. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.